Cruz. Awesome. All right, well, welcome to the parents, and I understand some grandparents uh, here today. So I have to apologize a little bit for this lecture. It would be much easier. The, the second year neuroscience course that I teach has a little more relatable topics like stroke and migraine and dementia. And we are right now in the middle of um, <laughs> some very, uh, well, a little bit uh, tedious neuroanatomy here. We're going through the brainstem and the cerebellum. So uh, for those of you parents that are not in the medical field, some of this will be a bit difficult to follow. So with that apology here, we'll get started. Um, now for um, students here, if you're looking at this drawing and it doesn't look quite as professional as some of the other drawings, that's because uh, this is mine, okay? Most of the drawings in the handouts are from previous medical students who've just created wonderful uh, illustrations, but uh, this is the best I could do here. So we're gonna uh, just go over a big picture again of the cerebellum, which we've done before. And now we're going to add some details and tie together a lot of what we've been going through in the brainstem um, as it relates to the cerebellum. All right, so we're going to start up here with the motor cortex. All right, and so this pathway we've talked about so much here, the cortical spinal tract, which remember travels down, crosses here at the junction between the medulla and spinal cord to activate appropriate anterior horn cells throughout the length of your spinal cord to move appropriate muscles. Okay, so here we have... Uh, roots, plexus, peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction, and muscle here for movement. Now, the function of the cerebellum, remember, is to act as a comparator. So it needs to get that motor program. It needs to know what the brain is intending to do with regards to movement. And so a parallel pathway is sent along with the cortical spinal tract. And in green here, this is the corticoponto cerebellar tract. So it goes from the cortex down to the pontine nuclei. We've been pointing those out here in our section through the pons. And then this crosses over in this area here called the middle cerebellar peduncle. So every level of the brain stem is con connected to the cerebellum by a cerebellar peduncle. And for the pons, this is the middle cerebellar peduncle. The easiest one to remember because there's only one pathway that goes through the middle cerebellar peduncle. All right, so again, the cortical, Ponto cerebellar tract. And so um, we pointed these out just kind of to be able to identify them. That, and we said that anything going in or out of the cerebellum has to relay through these deep cerebellar nuclei. Okay, dentate, dentate, emboliform, globose, and vestigial. And so we said from lateral to medial, dogs eat good food. That's the way you can kind of remember those. All right, so the information here would, would synapse in these deep cerebellar nuclei on its way to the cerebellar cortex. Okay, so now the cerebellum knows the intended movement. Okay, but to act as a comparator, it needs to know what you're actually doing with your arm and legs. And so um, uh, information is picked up here by muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. And so the spinal cerebellar tracts, remember there are four of them that we've been over. Uh, we'll send that information to the cerebellum. Okay, most of these, three of the four, go through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And then remember, we have this one oddball pathway here that I didn't label. I was trying not to make this drawing too messy, but since we've talked about it enough here, the ventral spinal cerebellar tract, which remember, crosses twice. Very strange pathway. Crosses in the spinal cord, and then a second time in the superior cerebellar peduncle. And so the big picture is now the cerebellum knows the intended movement. It knows how you're actually doing in terms of coordinating the movement. It compares the two. And then it sends a corrective pathway out through the superior cerebellar peduncle back up to the motor cortex so that with every movement in real time, the motor cortex is getting that feedback. And it smooths out. It makes movement very precise. So therefore, if you have a lesion in the cerebellum, you get a very clumsy, uh, poorly coordinated movement that is called ataxia. Okay, now we also have down here the uh, flocculonodular lobe, which I drew separately here. It's part of the cerebellum, but we'll see um, has a, a different emphasis or function. Okay, let's go to another layer of activity in terms of what's going on here in the cerebellum. First of all, in green, we have this kind of a triangle here that goes from the red nucleus in the midbrain down to the inferior olivary nucleus 
And from the inferior olivary nucleus, we said that that nucleus is really a displaced part of the cerebellum. It's in the medulla, but its function is really entirely with regards to the cerebellum. And so we have this pathway going from the inferior olivary nucleus to the cerebellum, and later we will label these fibers as climbing fibers. I'll say more about that. And then from the cerebellum back to the red nucleus, and this, so this circuit is continually active here. So um, the red nucleus, we've said several things about its function. Um, so we've said there's an upper motor neuron pathway that comes from the red nucleus, and here it is here in yellow. This is the rubrospinal tract. Okay, but this, the red nucleus also is important in terms of uh, a cerebellar circuit here. Okay, the other thing to point out in this slide is we have something going on uh, down here. So with the flocculonodular nodular lobe, um, the deep cerebellar nucleus that communicates with the flocculonodular nodular lobe is the vestigial nucleus. Okay, and so we have this pathway here from the flocculonodular nodular lobe, especially to the vestibular nuclei, VN, here in the medulla, uh, that is very important. We'll discuss for eye movements in the second year course. Um, and also, remember we have upper motor neuron pathways that originate from the vestibular nuclei, so the vestibulospinal tracts. Um, and so the cerebellum uh, is not an upper motor neuron, right? but the cerebellum talks to upper motor neurons that regulate movement. So in the last slide, we, we said that it communicates with the motor cortex. Well, there's your upper motor neuron cortical spinal tract, but it also communicates with the vestibular nucleus for movement. It communicates with the red nucleus and there we've got an upper motor neuron pathway. So it's, it's really communicating with all of your upper motor neuron nuclei um, to facilitate movement. Okay, so um, in our brain dissection lab, we pointed out the cerebellum here. Remember, we've got the cerebellar tentorium, that reflection of the dura that slides in between the occipital lobe and the cerebellum. And the cerebellum, just compared to the huge gyri here in the brain, that in the cerebellum, you know, the, the folia here, very intricate. And it is amazing that more than half the neurons in the brain are found in the cerebellum. Okay, so this is obviously a lot going on here. Um, and there's even some evidence that the cerebellum is involved in some cognitive um, function as well. So remember looking at a sagittal section here, we have our anterior lobe of the cerebellum and much larger here, the posterior lobe. Uh, the flocculonodular lobe, we need to cut this off and kind of look here in the, this area for the flocculonodular lobe. Okay, so the lobes of the cerebellum are the anterior, posterior, and flocculonodular lobe. The anterior lobe is, uh, much of the anterior lobe is made up of the vermis. <clears throat> and so this is sometimes called the spinocerebellum because um, a lot of the input um, from these spinocerebellar pathways into the cerebellum goes to the anterior lobe. And so the, the rule of thumb with the cerebellum is the more midline the lesion is, the more midline the deficits are going to be. So if you have a problem with the anterior lobe and the vermis, it tends to be a midline truncal ataxia, and the patient has a wide-based unsteady gait called the gait ataxia. The posterior lobes make up most of the lateral hemispheres, and this is sometimes called the cerebrocerebellum because um, a lot of the posterior lobes communicate with the motor cortex. Okay, and so because these tend to be more lateral, if you have a lesion of the posterior lobe, the more lateral it is, the more lateral the ataxia is going to be. So the clumsiness with the hand would be more a feature with a posterior lobe um, lesion. And then the flocculonodular lobe is sometimes called the vestibulocerebellum because it communicates so much with vestibular nuclei. Vestibular nuclei are very important for regulating eye movements. And so if we have a problem with the flocculonodular lobe, these patients tend to have nystagmus, their eyes kind of jiggle. Okay, and we have a variety of eye movement problems that I won't talk about that can occur from lesions there. And anytime you have nystagmus um, and you distort the vestibular system, from the patient's perspective, that creates vertigo. Okay, so a room spinning kind of sensation uh, would be common with lesions here. And if you have vertigo, well, that's going to affect your balance, right? So they're going to have some gait ataxia as well. 
All right, so looking at the cerebellum, we can see here in green the posterior lobe. Okay, again, makes up the bulk of the cerebellum. In blue, the floccular nodular lobe. Okay, we pointed out the nodulus that is midline here and kind of intrudes into the fourth ventricle. And then the anterior lobe um, here in red. And I like this drawing just because it kind of emphasizes that if we look at the vermis here, that that the vermis makes up a large portion of the anterior lobe of the cerebellum. So here's the posterior lobe, flocular nodular lobe, and in terms of the longitudinal zones, again we have the vermis here along the midline. As we move out laterally, this is sometimes called the paravermis, and then uh, the lateral hemispheres that are of the posterior lobe of the cerebellum. Okay, so this is a little bit difficult here, so I'll say it a few times um, to kind of make relationships here between specific parts of the cerebellum and uh, deep cerebellar nuclei and the brainstem. Um, so when, when I show you the cerebellar cortex here in a few minutes, um, I'll make the point that 100% of the output of the cerebellum is from the Purkinje cells. Okay, so Purkinje cells are very important here, and that's, that's all 100% of the output. So Purkinje cells at any part of the cerebellar cortex, now we're talking about the vermis, um, will project to different deep cerebellar nuclei. So if we're speaking of the vermis or the floccular nodular lobe, it's the vestigial nucleus that's involved. Okay, and the vestigial nucleus, um, now just to think about this, we said the vermis coordinates truncal midline musculature. So what are pathways we've talked about that coordinate midline muscles? Well, we mentioned the reticulospinal tract and the vestibulospinal tract. These are both involved in midline truncal movement. Okay, so the vermis via the vestigial nucleus and via communication with some of these uh, upper motor neuron nuclei in the brain stem, therefore can regulate midline muscles. Okay, that's why you get a gait ataxia, midline problem, when you have lesions of the vermis. Okay, and of course the vestibular system, um, you know, important for things like the vestibulo-ocular reflex, and so um, we could have some problems there uh, with different lesions. So if we move out a little bit laterally to the paravermis, um, now it's not so much truncal midline, but more proximal muscles that are coordinated here. And so for the paravermis, um, now we move out and supply these more lateral deep cerebellar nuclei known as the globose and emboliform nuclei. Okay, and these travel to a couple of different areas. Okay, they communicate with the red nucleus and somewhat also to the motor cortex. Again, to facilitate movement, somewhat more for proximal muscles. Now I know I told you that the cortical spinal tract and rubrospinal tract has an emphasis on distal muscles. Okay, but there's also some uh, activation for proximal muscles as well, and that seems to be facilitated uh, by the paravermis. Okay, the lateral hemispheres, the largest portion of the cerebellum, the Purkinje cells here project to the dentate nucleus, and this is why the dentate nucleus, when we looked at it, is so much larger than the other deep cerebellar nuclei because there's so much information um, that is synapsing there. Okay, and so remember this is the pathway that goes back up to your motor cortex. Okay, so anything going into the brain, remember, has to go through a thalamic nucleus. Olfaction is the only exception. And so the uh, thalamic nucleus that you need to know that has a function for the cerebellum is the VL, ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus. So then this will go to the contralateral motor cortex, again, to facilitate movement uh, especially with regards to the corticospinal tract. Okay. That was difficult. We're going to come back and say that again. Okay, so that hopefully it, it'll stick a little bit better. Now, um, here are the four spinocerebellar tracts that we talked about. So remember, the cerebellum needs to get uh, information about what you're actually doing with your limbs. And so two of these are for the lower extremities. And uh, we pointed those out all the way up through the spinal cord and into the brain stem. And these are the dorsal and ventrospinal cerebellar tracts. So essentially everything below T6 is traveling through those two pathways. And so um, the upper extremity equivalent of those are the cuneo, 
and the rostrospinocerebellar tract. Okay, so that's upper extremity. So the information is either picked up by muscle spindles or Golgi tendon organs. And there's a slight difference here in terms of the speed of input. The 1A fibers are a bit faster than the 1B sensory fibers. Uh, the only relay nucleus I would like you to know is the Clark's nucleus, okay, which we hammered quite a bit in the spinal cord lecture. And we associated that with the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. Yes? Mm -hmm. The question is why the anterior lobe mainly has a truncal midline ataxia, and it is because so much of the anterior lobe is the vermis, and so it does seem to be more a truncal midline uh, portion of the cerebellum. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Clark's nucleus you need to know. And then remember the rule of thumb with, with the spinal cerebellar tracts is that they go through the inferior cerebellar peduncle, except for this odd pathway, the ventral spinal cerebellar tract, which remember it crosses twice. It's the only one that does that. And it gets back into the cerebellum through the superior cerebellar peduncle. And again, I have no idea why it's wired that way. It actually goes to the same place of the cerebellum as all the other pathways, but it gets there through a much more uh, complicated manner. All right, so we refer to this as unconscious proprioception. Remember to distinguish from conscious proprioception. So the knowledge of where your limbs are in space is my thumb up or down. That's conscious proprioception. That's posterior columns, right? Unconscious proprioception is what your cerebellum is doing all the time uh, to facilitate uh, movement as a comparator. All right, so um, here are the deep cerebellar nuclei, again, from lateral dentate Globosymboliform, and most medial here, the uh, vestigial. Okay, so from our um, brainstem lectures here, we pointed them out back here. The dentate, which is very large, um, globosymboliform, and vestigial. And there is the nodulus of the floccular nodular lobe projecting into the fourth ventricle. Okay, let's say it again now with respect to the deep cerebellar nuclei. So remember the vermis floccular nodular lobe is important for truncal midline musculature, and so you have to associate that with the vestigial nucleus. Paravermis, more proximal muscles, and so the uh, deep cerebellar nuclei you need to associate with that function are globose and emboliform. The lateral hemispheres, more distal extremities, and so the deep cerebellar nucleus there is the dentate nucleus. And the lateral hemispheres, this is, a lot is unknown about this, but um, the experience, if any of you play a, a musical instrument and you just rehearse, like maybe a run with your hand on the piano or something, you do that a million times. Well, this is the cerebellum that is really over time more precisely laying down um, that very finely tuned information. So a lot of the motor planning, and programs here are a function of lateral hemispheres. All right, so let's show this here in pictures. So here's the cerebellum, and here is the vermis. Okay, so the Purkinje cells here in the vermis and also in the floccular nodular lobe are going to relay through the vestigial nucleus. Okay, and so now we need to communicate with upper motor neuron pathways that move midline muscles. And so the vestibular nuclei and the reticular formation are the areas here in the medulla that are involved. So then our upper motor neuron pathways, vestibular spinal tract, reticular spinal tract, are activated then, or maybe activated is the wrong word, facilitated by information coming from the uh, vermis. Okay, not an easy drawing here, but uh, in yellow is the dentate. And so right here, we're looking at the globose and emboliform nuclei. And so again, that's a bit more proximal muscles, not so much midline. And so this pathway then talks to the red nucleus right here to um, have a role in coordinating its function as an upper motor neuron pathway. And some of these fibers will also go up to the motor cortex. And this is the thalamic nucleus here, VL of the thalamus, on its way up. Okay, the dentate. Uh, this is an important one. 
that you can need to remember that the dentate nucleus, the largest nucleus, and it communicates with the motor cortex here in the brain. So this goes up to the motor cortex, and again, the thalamic nucleus that's most important for the cerebellum is VL. And it turns out if we have a lesion in the dentate, that tends to produce a, a very severe ataxia, maybe more so than in other places in the cerebellum. Okay, let's talk about the cerebellar peduncles. So remember, all information going in or out has to travel through these cerebellar peduncles. So the most, we've said that the cere superior cerebellar peduncle, this is mainly efferent. It's going out to the motor cortex. Okay, but we always have to have an exception, usually. And so in this case, it's the ventral spinal cerebellar tract that is actually traveling in uh, to the um, cerebellum through the superior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, the middle cerebellar peduncle is the easiest one to remember because it's just one pathway, and that's the cortico-ponto cerebellar tract. So this is 100% afferent. It actually turns out that the cerebellum is getting in about 40 times more information than it's sending out. In general, the cerebellum is receiving lots of information. And then we have the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So um, I didn't highlight this because we've talked about it so much that three of the four spinocerebellar tracts go in through the uh, inferior cerebellar peduncle. But the new information here is that the vestibular nuclei are continually communicating back and forth with the cerebellum. Okay, so next year when we talk about eye movements, we'll, we'll explain the, some of the significance of that. But this communication is through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, and the other bit of information going through the inferior cerebellar peduncle is through the inferior olivary nucleus. And so I don't know why this is deemed to be so important by board exams, but I'll just ask you to highlight this, that the name for these fibers are called climbing fibers that go from the inferior olivary nucleus to the cerebellum. Okay, and I'll, I'll give you maybe a reason why some people think that might be important. Okay, so uh, our section we went through a few days ago on the medulla, all right, so here's the inferior olivary nucleus, and so the inferior olivary nucleus as it communicates with the cerebellum is going through the inferior cerebellar peduncle right here. Okay, so a lot of fibers here, and again, these are climbing fibers. We give them a special name from the inferior olive. The vestibular nuclei that we pointed out in this area Okay, right adjacent to the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So not hard to imagine here that information is continually going back and forth from the cerebellum uh, to the vestibular nuclei here in the medulla. Okay, so um, any other fibers that go into the cerebellum are just called, all lumped together, we call them mossy fibers. Okay, the only thing we call uh, climbing fibers are the ones that are coming from the inferior olive. Okay. Now, we used to have a whole hour lecture on the cerebellar cortex, and um, I decided a few years ago this was just a bit too detailed, if maybe we're doing a PhD in neuroscience or something. So there are just a, like three things I want you to know about the cerebellar cortex, which I think is enough, really, to make sense of this. The first is about the climbing fibers, okay, that come from the inferior olive. And so these synapse here on the uh, Purkinje cells, and these are glutamate, uh, they utilize glutamate, which remember is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And this has a very powerful effect on the Purkinje cells. All right, and so it, it appears that the climbing fibers here from the inferior olive are probably the most important in terms of motor learning. So they seem to have a role in laying down those motor pathways. Um, again, using our example, maybe playing the piano. The inferior olive connection here seems to be quite important for that. All right, so there's a lot going on here that, uh, that we're not going to go into here in this course, but another point to make here that I think is important um, is that 100% of the output of the cerebellum is from these Purkinje cells, and notice this utilizes GABA, so this is inhibitory. Okay, so it's excitatory from the climbing fibers to the Purkinje cells, it's inhibitory, utilizing GABA uh, out from the Purkinje cells. So remember, we said that Purkinje cells then, uh, this relays out to the deep cerebellar nuclei. 
okay, inhibition, and also some to the uh, vestibular nuclei. All right, so a very busy slide, but I'm just going to make the same point here, which is about the climbing fibers that come up here and interact with the uh, Purkinje cells. That's excitatory. And then a lot happens, a lot of interneurons, a lot of complex stuff that the cerebellum is working on, you know, facilitating this movement, comparing the intended with the actual, and then the corrective pathway out is inhibitory. Okay, so again, here are the take-home points about the cerebellar cortex, that Purkinje cells get excitatory information from the inferior olivary nucleus, all other input, whatever it is, cortical pontocerebellar tract, anything else going into the cerebellum we call mossy fibers, and that all output from the cerebellum is via the Purkinje cells, and that is inhibitory, GABA. Okay, and so Purkinje cells talk to the deep cerebellar nuclei and also to the vestibular nuclei. Okay, let's, uh, before we get to some clinical aspects of the cerebellum, uh, let me just go over this uh, triangle one more time. It's called Mollerae's triangle. Okay, and so this is the one that goes from the red nucleus down to the inferior olivary nucleus. And so these are climbing fibers then that are going through the inferior cerebellar peduncle to the dentate, okay, and then to the cerebellar cortex, and then back out to the red nucleus. So the reason I even bring this up is, uh, first of all, that you realize there's a clinical syndrome that occurs with a lesion right here, the central tegmental tract. And I showed you a video of a patient with a lesion right here. And remember, that will give you palatal myoclonus, where the palate just continually goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And I've seen several patients with this. They usually complain of like an annoying ear clicking as the palate is going up and down. And you look in the mouth, and you can just see the, the palate doing this. Okay, very annoying, it persists during sleep, so it kind of drives patients crazy. Uh, but if you see that, you know where the lesion is. Okay, so you're going to need to get an MRI scan, uh, and you're expecting to find something here in the pons. Okay, the other important aspect of this is that you know these are climbing fibers from the inferior olive to the dentate nucleus. Very powerful excitatory connection. All right, so let's go through a few clinical things that can happen with lesions of the cerebellum. So we have two hours in the second year neuroscience course on stroke and hemorrhage in the brain. And so here we can see, uh, obviously, um, a lesion right here. Now, we haven't gone over neuroradiology yet, but I will tell you that when we do a CT scan, um, two things look bright on a CT, calcium or acute hemorrhage. Okay, so this is the calcified skull. That's normal. Okay, but if you're seeing something bright like this in the brain, then there are a few things that can calcify in the brain, uh, but this is obviously abnormal. So this is a hemorrhage in the cerebellum. Okay, the other thing that I will tell you when we start doing neuroradiology is when you look at these, you want to imagine the patient lying on their back, feet coming out toward you, because we always need to keep right and left straight when we're doing neurology. All right, and so this is a hemorrhage here in the left cerebellum, and some of the blood here is going into the fourth ventricle. All right, so what kind of problems would a patient like this have? Well, first of all, we want to know, you know, is the deficit going to be ipsilateral or contralateral? And most things that we've said in neurology, if a patient has a lesion in the left hemisphere of the brain, they're going to be weak on the right side. They're going to have sensory loss on the right side. But it's a bit trickier here with the cerebellum because the ataxia is actually ipsilateral. Okay, and so the, the point of going over this in some detail is that you can, it's believable to you, why is the ipsilateral ataxia? So let's just say this is left hemisphere, and let's say this is the right cerebellum. So what is the right cerebellum doing? Well, it's getting information from the left hemisphere to move the right arm and leg. It's getting that information from the right arm and leg, and then is talking back to the left hemisphere so that it can more appropriately move muscles on the right side. So if you have a lesion here of the right cerebellum, okay, it's not going to be able to communicate with the left hemisphere, which is trying to move the right arm and leg. So the ataxia then is going to be 
ipsilateral. Okay, so the clumsiness is going to be on the same side as the lesion. Okay, so patients with strokes or hemorrhages in the cerebellum will present with ataxia on the same side. Okay, so remember that looks like a real clumsiness as the patient's trying to touch their nose, the hand will shake back and forth like this. As they're trying to reach out for your finger, the hand is kind of, kind of go back and forth. So if you see that, you know you need to image the appropriate area, and so we need to take a picture, CT or MRI scan, that'll look at the cerebellum. Now the other thing we can see, and I think I mentioned that um, I, I really have rarely been able to actually appreciate this in patients I've seen with cerebellar strokes and hemorrhages, that because the cerebellum does communicate with these upper motor neurons that are very important for muscle tone, that if you have a lesion of the cerebellum, you can get some hypotonia, some loss of muscle tone. But Boy, that is hard to appreciate. Um, and sometimes um, you can see something that are called pendular reflexes. So imagine we're tapping on the patellar tendon, and if we have a cerebellar lesion, because there's less tone, the leg, instead of just kicking out and coming back, it may just swing back and forth a few times because there's less muscle tone. Okay, But honestly, this is more of a bored thing to know than something you would see in real patients. So sorry about that, but that's just the way it is. Um, anytime we have a cerebellar lesion, and again, more likely if it's involving the floccular nodular lobe, then we'll get some nystagmus. Um, well, we would see that with cerebellar hemisphere lesions also. And we'll talk about different nystagmus patterns in our neuro-ophthalmology lecture in the second year course. But just for now, no, that's classically part of cerebellar lesions. Okay, and how about this great word here? It's like one of those long German uh, words. So, dysdiadocokinesia, okay, which uh, describes a dis is bad, and uh, kinesia is movement, and diadoko is, I think, succeeding, bad succeeding movement. That's what it means. And uh, essentially, this describes an inability to maintain a regular rhythm and even force during movement. So, we said one thing we want to do on neurologic examination is finger tapping. It's a really helpful exam. Patients with cerebellar lesions have a hard time just very precisely tapping regular at a regular speed and with the same force. Or we might ask them to uh, do this with their hand on, on their thigh. Okay, We can keep a regular rhythm if you don't have a cerebellar problem. But if you have a cerebellar lesion, it's really hard to do that accurately and provide the same amount of force um, over and over. The other thing that we see with cerebellar lesions uh, is uh, our action tremors. Okay, and so just, again, imagine we're losing that really integrated communication between the cerebellum and the motor cortex. So as the patient moves, their corrective, the, the corrective function is lost, and so they tend to have some tremors as well. All right, uh, another condition that commonly involves the cerebellum is uh, due to alcoholism. All right, so this is usually over many decades. Um, and again, the, the heavier the alcohol consumption, the more likely this is to occur. So uh, I'm sorry we even have the red circles here. It's not needed. But here is a healthy cerebellum. And here we can see just a lot of atrophy of the cerebellum. And so the, uh, in general, alcoholism uh, more likely affects midline portions of the cerebellum, the vermis and the anterior lobe. And so what you would see in terms of a gait pattern in a... Uh, an alcoholic patient with this condition, it's a, because it's truncal midline, they, they're going to space their feet apart. Okay, they're going to have a wide-based gait to try to steady themselves. So they'll be unsteady, but they'll kind of be spacing their feet apart to try to avoid falling. And it would be really hard with someone with this degree of atrophy um, to walk a line. So when we do the heel-to-shin testing, we ask them to walk on a line, uh, that's, you know, they're going to need to steady them or they're going to fall over if you're doing that test. All right, there are several medications that can affect the cerebellum, but one of them is, it's an older anticonvulsant to prevent seizures, but um, it's still commonly used, called phenytoin. When you get into the third and fourth year, everyone will call it dilantin, but for now you need to know the generic, phenytoin. <coughs> and so um, this is a medication where patients often will get toxic um, very easily, and so their blood levels will spike and when they go too high, this affects uh, cerebellar circuits, 
And so these patients have ataxia. They tend to be very unsteady, wobbly, falling, um, and they have nystagmus. So they have symptoms that indicate a cerebellar problem. So if you're following a patient with epilepsy who's on phenytoin, and all of a sudden they're exhibiting some cerebellar signs, um, well, they're probably toxic on their medication. Better get a blood level and find out if it's too high. Okay, another common condition we'll, we'll talk more about in the second year neuroscience course, it's a relatively common childhood uh, brain tumor um, called a medulloblastoma. And these are tumors that tend to occur right along the midline of the cerebellum. Okay, and so since that's going to affect more likely the vermis and the flocculonodular lobe, it, they tend to have a gait ataxia, so they're very unsteady, um, and they'll likely have some nystagmus. Okay, and the other thing that often happens with the medulloblastoma is it interferes with flow of CSF. Because remember, these CSF pathways are midline, like the fourth ventricle, the cerebral aqueduct. And so often very early, because this is affecting flow of CSF, patient, patients will develop a non-communicating hydrocephalus. So the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle dilate. And so if you've got acute hydrocephalus, then these children will often complain of a headache, all right, and you'll find some other findings of increased intracranial pressure. So maybe look in the eyes and you'll see papilledema in kids that have this um, type of tumor. Okay, another condition that can affect the cerebellum is called perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration. Remember what perineoplastic means. So we see neoplastic here, we think cancer. Uh, but perineoplastic is not a direct effect of the cancer. It's not the tumor pushing on nerves or pushing on the cerebellum. Um, this is kind of a very complex autoimmune process where um, uh, antibodies um, in response to the tumor will attack parts of the nervous system. And in this case, uh, antibodies are directed against Purkinje cells. Okay, and we can actually measure these. There are a bunch of these uh, antibodies that we can look for. And so these are often patients that we see in clinic, and they're coming in with ataxia. And you do an MRI scan of the brain, you don't see much, and you're a little bit confused. Why does the patient have ataxia? Um, well, you'd want to consider a perineoplastic causes in that case. So um, where I work at the VA, I've seen a number of patients, uh, smokers, and oftentimes this will come before the lung cancer is identified. So the ataxia is first. Um, and we find this by checking specific Purkinje cell antibodies, and then you know, we'll look vigilantly for any evidence of cancer. So the three cancers that would be most common here probably are lung, ovarian, and, and breast cancer. Okay, and then finally, Friedrich's ataxia, again a condition that we will um, have a lot more to say about in the second year neuroscience course. Uh, this is an autosomal recessive condition that usually um, starts in childhood years between age 8 to 16. And there's a lot of neuroanatomy that's affected um, in this condition. Um, first of all, these uh, spinocerebellar tracts that we've been talking about uh, degenerate pretty early in Friedrich's ataxia. So patients are deprived, the cerebellum is deprived of that information about what your arms and legs are doing. So they have ataxia from involvement there. Okay, but to make things worse, so much else is involved. The peripheral nerves are affected, and they have peripheral neuropathy. Okay, so that's another, now we've got a conscious proprioception uh, issue. And the posterior columns degenerate, okay, which further compounds the ability to uh, uh, have conscious proprioception. And we have some upper motor neuron involvement here with the cortical spinal tract. Okay, so they will even have some spastic weakness. So it's a lot that's going on in these patients. And this is the first of several what are called trinucleotide repeat conditions that we'll talk about in the neuroscience course. Um, and so if you think about Friedrich's ataxia, you can just send the patient to the lab and do a genetics test to confirm um, the diagnosis. And so just to look here at a spinal cord section in someone with Friedrich's ataxia, so remember all of the white matter here should look like this, dark. And so what we see is degeneration out here of the dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tracts. Here is degeneration of the cortical spinal tract. And uh, look how severely affected the posterior columns here. Okay, so we have severe loss of uh, fasciculus grossalis and cuneatus here um, in the posterior columns. 
Okay, so let me just finish up here, if this will work, by trying to show a video of a patient with Okay, and I'll, I'll just preface this. Last year when I, I showed a video, uh, a parent asked me afterwards, are your patients okay with you showing videos? And I, just, this, I made this a long time ago, but when I told this patient I would use this to instruct medical students, uh, he was just delighted, so pleased that uh, students would get some benefit from this. Um, so first of all, I just, I'm going to play a few seconds here of him talking. And I didn't mention this in class, but the cerebellum regulates every movement, including the ability to speak. Um, not like in terms of an aphasia, but more like the, the rhythm and cadence of, of uh, talking. And so his, his speech is affected in part from his cerebellar condition. Take these two fingers and... Yesterday, I wasn't even able to move this hand, but right. today I can at least... Good. I'm glad so it's better. So he's uh, try quite a bit better because of some fingers. treatment. He's better on the other side. Okay, good. Let's see you take this finger now. I want you just to try and touch your nose with that finger. So That's a good example of eight. Right, now reach out and touch my finger. Now go back and forth as fast as you can between your nose and the finger. Back and forth. Back and forth. Touch your nose. And patients will often do that when you do finger to nose. They'll laugh. And you know, you can say, well, I want to make it hard for you, give you a challenge. and. Um, all right, so any questions here on anything we've said about the cerebellum? Yes? So when you were talking about um, alcoholism and long-term degeneration of the cerebellum, like that is quite severe, is there any immediate path that precedes the acute alcohol um, and then it would be like the acute alcohol and then it would be like the acute alcohol and then it would be like the acute alcohol and then it would be like the alcohol intoxication does also affect the cerebellum. So that is why the police do the heel to shin walking. Um, you know, but that's, that's going to go away as the patient you know, kind of detoxes. But the problem of going, experiencing that again and again and again is that it does have a degenerative effect um, on those areas of the cerebellum. Yeah, good. All right, hope you guys have a great day. Thank you.